from the frenetic cities of New York and Hong Kong, an outspoken American who has spent her career in fashion and art dealing moves to the rural Suffolk countryside and finds herself seemingly marooned and bored in amongst quiet nature. But Joanne Uy never sits still for long. She founded first EA Festival, an arts and culture festival in East Anglia, and then EA Sustain, a biennial festival about environment, culture and entrepreneurship. Today, she talks to Metro Wild about leaving hectic city life and discovering her higher purpose serving the local community in Suffolk from her new quiet countryside home. This is the Metro Wild podcast where we celebrate city life and wild nature. I'm your host, Yang Mei Ui. Joanne Ui was born in Singapore and grew up in Cincinnati in the United States. She trained as a lawyer in New York, but moved to Hong Kong, where she was creative director at the Chinese fashion house Shanghai Tang. Joanne was also the co-CEO of Hong Kong's Clean Air Network, and with her co-CEO was nominated onto Time magazine's 100 Most Influential list in 2011. Among her other entrepreneurial interests, Joanne also founded an avant-garde art gallery and an e-commerce site specialising in fine jewellery. Joanne now lives in Suffolk in the UK and is the founder of EA Sustain. And I'm very proud to say she's also my cousin. Joanne Uy, you have previously lived in Cincinnati, New York and Hong Kong. What did you love about life in those cities? Honestly, I didn't like living in Cincinnati at the time that it was happening. But in retrospect, I think that it was a very stable, safe and archetypal American environment to grow up in, complete with all of its challenges during the 80s, which is when I began to remember my childhood. So Cincinnati has always been the bellwether presidential election state. So that kind of gives you an idea of how it it literally falls in the center of the bell curve in terms of American mainstream culture. I mean, that's definitely a plus and a minus. And looking back at it now, I am glad that I grew up in what I call white bread America so that I have a very, I have a very strong and, and comprehensive understanding of what it means to be American pros and cons. So that it was invaluable. I also think it was great to grow up in a place which wasn't full of temptations and dangers because whatever there was, I'm, I mean, I was still a pretty out of control teenager. And if I had lived in a place like New York city, God knows what it would, would have happened to me. <laughs> uh, the temptations were pretty limited to things like the three nightclubs in the Ohio river. And, and there wasn't as much damage that I could do to myself or the neighborhood compared to a place like a London or a New York or even, um, let's say, Chicago. For New York, I would say that was invaluable because it was the first time I was exposed to a truly cosmopolitan environment, and also a place where, I coming from Cincinnati, there weren't many people even of kind of upper middle class, middle class background who were different in Cincinnati. So here, at least, I was exposed to people who had gone to prep school, who were from a lot more racial, racial ethnic backgrounds. Um, it, it was an exciting place, brimming with energy and danger and edginess. And I really reveled in that because also I'm somebody who loves style and aestheticism. So it was the first place in my life where I was actually exposed to that and able to express myself. For example, I I was crazy about fashion as a teenager growing up in Cincinnati, but there was no place to really manifest that in a way that was rewarding living in Cincinnati, Ohio. So New York, I mean, it was a smorgasbord of learning and temptation. And I think I indulged in a big part of that, even as a student and spent very little time on Columbia campus where I was supposed to be attending class. Um, as for Hong Kong, 
where I spent over 20 years. I think that the most valuable thing about Hong Kong was being able to leapfrog over phases of career development, which would have taken several years, but in Hong Kong would take one or two, where it's a kind of place which had such a powerful Wild West entrepreneurial vibe that you could just wake up one day and say, okay, tomorrow I want to become a talking head on TV or the next day an art gallerist, the next day an environmental activist. I mean, those are some of the hats that I wore while I was there, and it was easy to turn your life on a dime. So I think in terms of, um, how would you say? It's a place where you could be the, a chameleon or where you could set your sights on what would feel like an impossible dream in another location. So that was, that was very powerful. Uh, as a place to grow up as a young adult, fresh out of law school. Um, and also, again, it was literally, and it continues to be it's in, in my life experience, the most hectic, frantic, intense place I've ever lived, like New York City cubed. Now, with the advent of messaging technology, which in Hong Kong was adopted far before it was in North America or Europe with a, a crazy intensity where people were WhatsApping at all hours of the day, working on the weekend, messaging 24 hours a day, five years before it started to happen over here. Um, I would say that it's a place I wouldn't want to live again. Um, but I, I look back on it fondly because I think it really stretched me to the, my maximum capacity of energy and energy and organization as well as socializing. Cities are brilliant in that there is this energy. You can be whoever you want. It, it can also beat people down because if you come to a city with great dreams, but perhaps a bit of bad luck, not enough talent or whatever it is, you can really fall through the cracks. And you were in these major cities in on the American continent, in Asia. And I, in my 20s, uh, spent decades uh, in London. And London has a big city energy, but it's a different kind of energy from what you have described. And it was perfect for me to build my legal career as a lawyer. And also it was a, a great place to be as an aspiring writer. And I did become a writer because of the, all of the opportunities there. And it's not just the agents are there, the publishers are there, but you get a vibe and energy. You're connecting with other creative people or even the sort of professions, the lawyers, you're, you're getting ideas all the time because of the mix and the diversity. And I hear what you're saying about completely not wanting to live in, in Hong Kong anymore. I, I can't imagine living in that place, which seems to me so much more frenetic than anywhere else. For me, London served its purpose. And I'm now, I've now moved to Oxford and it, it works for me. It's a city that has uh, academics and intellectual ideas and creativity, but it's a smaller, more manageable place. And perhaps cities are places for the young. What do you think? Cities are definitely destinations for the young where you have the physical and sensory faculties to actually take it all in and take advantage of it. I think that now that I'm older, I find it, I don't want to say I find it overwhelming because I definitely don't. I just find it unpleasant. Uh, the light, noise, air pollution, sound pollution, it all gets to me and wears me down. I think um, when I was in Hong Kong, I mean, I think I should actually mention that I was pretty ill and I, but however, it became this kind of baseline ill health was the norm. And I think it was very normal among a lot of the population because it's the densest, one of the densest places in the world and one of the most frenetic. So you moved to a small village in the Essex countryside in the UK some years ago. What was it like adapting to life in the country after the frenetic cities? Honestly, it was awful. The first two years that I lived in the countryside, it was like a roller coaster hitting a brick wall. So it wasn't just that. It was glacial, inert. It seemed to be boring. It was also due to the fact that I married to somebody who's much, much older, in which case the friends that we had when we first moved here weren't the kind of people who I would term my tribe. So that is what led me to establish my own business and projects so that I would, was able to create some kind of network and platform for myself and some raison d'etre to be out here in the countryside. So it was tough. I mean, I was very, 
It was isolating. It was random and arbitrary meeting new people. At the beginning, I met people by playing tennis, and that was extremely random. I don't think I'm in touch with any of those same people now. Um, I also found British social culture to be extremely difficult to navigate. Not that I didn't understand it intellectually right away, but it was completely inimical to my native personality, which is extremely gregarious, unafraid, outgoing, and always proactive. I find British social culture to be one that is reticent, cagey, full of doublespeak, totally counterproductive, time-wasting, and frustrating. So it, it, was, it was tough to make advances and gains in that kind of ecosystem where I had to hide what I was good at, could never say, well, my calling card is marketing. I can mark anyth- market anything from potato chips to Picasso's. It, that's just not the way one goes about uh, introducing oneself in the countryside. I'm a, I'm a fundamentally extremely commercial, gregarious person. And I think that Hong Kong was the crucible of my business personality. And I'm somebody who is unafraid to say, I kick ass at A, B, and C. And that is something that I had to muffle, even suffocate when I first moved out here. And that was extraordinarily difficult for me. Um, I, when I first moved out here, for example, I was very focused on two organizations that I wanted to work with. I ended up getting very high level introductions to the CEOs, but quickly discovered after speaking to them for about an hour that our cultural differences were too vast and that they looked at me as a Martian. I mean, that's just emblematic of my first two years living in the British countryside. So it was tough. And you can tell I'm somebody who relishes huge, huge challenges. I've always launched myself into unknown areas as well as categories of knowledge without any fear whatsoever. I think the great challenge for me was very personal. Sam, my my son, was living in Hong Kong still, and it was the first time we'd ever been separated. That made things much more emotionally adverse and lonely for me. Um, But anyway, during the pandemic, I decided to, on a whim pretty much, launch a festival because I thought of it as quite a manageable business project akin to a large wedding. And as it turned out, it was a big success uh, despite the, the, the difficulty of doing something completely new and the pandemic, which introduced a huge level of risk to the entire project at inception because there was a chance that it was going to be canceled entirely. Nevertheless, I went ahead and planned it six months in advance, and it ended up that it ended up um, the 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 lockdown ended up being lifted about two and a half weeks before the festival. But that was quite a harrowing experience. But thank God I did it. And since then, it's been very fun, smooth sailing, where I have ended up meeting in the past three or so years the most creative, collaborative, interesting entrepreneurial people in the East of England, I would say. I think there's so much there in what you've said. And um, well, we'll come back to the festival um, uh, shortly because that's going to be obviously the core of our discussion. Um, but what I wanted to pick up on was this cross-cultural aspect. And I think that with the um, English-speaking diaspora, if you like, which is British culture, Americans and Australians, very broadly speaking, um, everybody speaks English. And so you think, oh, yeah, you know, I can just live in any of these countries and fit in quite nicely. And of course, you're our American cousin, I'm the British one, and we've got cousins in Australia. And when we get together, the multiplicity of accents is completely international. And we're all so different. We we think of you as, oh, cousin Joanne, she's the American brash one. You know, the British ones are the sort of with, with a sort of plummy strawberry in their mouth. And the Australians are easygoing. And of course, this is terrible cliches that we have of each other. But there is this difference in the way that we speak, the way that we have to navigate social uh, interactions. Uh, When I was working in London as a lawyer, um, I generally got very good appraisals in terms of my ability as a lawyer. But I always, every single time, it was like, you know, you're too direct. And I think that's maybe, is it a Chinese thing, a Cantonese thing, a Malaysian thing? 
um, I'd come up to someone and say, oh, could you photocopy this? Oh, no, no, no. I you can't be as direct. You've got to ask about the weather. How was your weekend? Blah, blah, blah. And then, oh, do you mind awfully, if you have a moment, would you mind photocopying this? Um, and you just have to learn the way of the English in the way that I guess in America, if I, I, I'm not sure I would survive in America I'm or even Hong Kong, I might just get clobbered to death because I just couldn't cope with the directness. <laughs> I'm famous for being direct. I think that the great thing about being Chinese and American living where I do is that, that I get a free pass all the time and I sidestep a lot of the social issues and complications that come with being born English, actually. So I can just more or less be myself since I'm the uh, the boss of my own business, and I don't really have to. I don't really have to be shy or don another personality to fit in or to assimilate or anything like that. And people now know me well for being as direct as I am, and critical, and just and being very very plain spoken, efficient, and impatient with inefficiency. So let's let's dive straight into your festival. You had originally a cultural festival, but then you've evolved a second one, which is EA Sustain, uh, which you founded. And it's a festival about environment, culture and entrepreneurship. Can you tell us about that festival and what inspired you to create? OK, well, the, the original inspiration for that festival is dates back to my time as an environmentalist in Hong Kong when I was a clean air activist. And back then, I actually wanted to launch an art and environment project in the same vein as a British project called Kate Farewell, where artists were brought down to the South Pole to experience polar glacial melt firsthand. And they weren't there was no prescription for the type of output they were expected to create in the wake of their experience but it was roughly similar to that in concept that I wanted to implement a similar project in China because you had things like cancer villages. There was a huge amount of environmental devastation when I was an environmentalist living in Asia. So, however, that dream remained stillborn because I ended up doing a startup business and had to put that on the shelf. But fast forward many years later to when I moved here, I still had this idea that the intersection of environment and culture was extremely important and had and, and had a really um, pivotal role to play in winning hearts and minds over to the environment. So that is partly the wellspring of inspiration for EA Sustain. But of course, it also grew um, from EA Festival and its original success, where in the first edition of EA Festival, I sought to include environmental content. And for EA Festival number two, I started to do the same thing, but quickly found that I didn't have enough space in only a weekend festival, leading me to launch a freestanding new festival called EA Sustain, which was exclusively entirely dedicated to that subject. Now, there are three pillars to EA Sustain because the strap line of that festival is flourishing localism is key to decarbonization. What I have found um, living out in England has been that there is a very undeveloped marketing and entrepreneurship scene outside of London. And that's something that needs to be shored up and reinforced a lot if we are to develop better lifestyle, hospitality, cultural options where we live, which on a very simple basis would allow us to spend much more time not commuting to London, not visiting to London and leading a rewarding and complete life in a rural area. So that is actually the basic premise of how I program the content for EA Sustain. So it's not just all about the environment. It's all how it ties together with culture, highbrow culture, because that celebrates the beauty of nature, but also consumer culture. Because at bottom, this is a festival for ordinary citizens and the general public, and I want to awaken a threshold awareness among them because as consumers, they can really have an impact if they decide to take the knowledge that they gain from EA Sustain and apply it to the kitchen when they go grocery shopping, when they make their transportation choices, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's my goal. 
I have a sense that in the UK nationally, there is a sort of grumble uh, from the regions that mm, everybody's focused on London. A lot of resourcing is focused on London. And London tends to dominate the political landscapes, the uh, commercial landscape and, and businesses. And in particular, since in the pandemic, people um, uh, were able to work from home, that minimised a lot of travelling. And there were news reports around uh, the, the air being much uh, clearer, the skies being much less hazy because of the less use of transport. Uh, uh, but I think since then, we've all gone back to uh, not 100% the good old ways of travelling to work, of commuting. There, there has been a slowing down of travelling to work and so on, and more people are working from home. But to be able to focus commerce, retail, culture more locally in the regions, that surely must be a good thing economically, but also for the environment. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So there's a, there's a basic level, which is the tra transportation, use of public transportation and just not flying and driving around as much. But also, um, it also bleeds out into more lifestyle choices. And we did, we have very few cultural choices of excellence out here. And that's something I wanted to do to beef up the ecosystem. So can you give us a flavor of what the EA Sustain has offered uh, in terms of the programming um, and the people who've come uh, to as speakers, but also locally, what has been on um, uh, available uh, as your smorgasbord of, of things to do over the years at the festival? It's been quite a diverse range of topics under the rubric of the festival. So we had Caroline Lucas, who is the first and only Green MP in the UK. I mean, she is somebody who's just vastly inspiring because one of my goals is also to present iconic heroes of the environment who are just by their sheer energy, passion, and commitment. I want to expose the audience to people like that because they can feel the power of the individual and that they should not just wring their hands in despair that nothing they do can make a difference. So Sir Caroline Lucas is somebody who spoke. She opened the festival this year. I had a session about water pollution, and that's very, very much in the news practically every week these days. It was interesting. I was just reading about there was a rowing competition in Cambridge this past weekend, and one of the teams claimed that the reason they lost is because there was E. coli, e. coli in the Thames, which I found to be quite shocking. And there was a Rod Little op-ed piece on the subject of water pollution and how the water companies need to be renationalized urgently. So that was one subject with um, the co-founder of the top water pollution NGO, which is called River Action, Mark Cocker, who is arguably East Anglia's top naturalist, and he's inarguably the top ornithological writer probably in the world. Um, he talked about his most recent book, which is called One Midsummer's Day. There was a workshop for farmers about landscape recovery, how through greater coordination and, and um, cooperation, the joining up of their parcels of land could create biodiversity highways, which were contiguous throughout the rural landscape. We had a session about education, which starred the woman who instigated the Natural History GCSE. I just wanted to pick up on your uh, workshop for farmers. How did they respond? Were they open to this idea? Did they want to do that? Or was it, oh, well, we can't do that for various economic reasons? Well, the workshop was, it was very, very successful. It was one of the most attended events. First, it was captained by a very well-known farmer in the region who's extremely popular, who has been at the forefront of regenerative agriculture. So that was important because he's somebody who's known for what he does. And it was done in conjunction with Suffolk Wildlife Trust, which actually has an arm giving advice to farmers on exactly this subject. So those there's these two parties captained this talk. Um, and one of the topics was the funding available to farmers and what are the grant schemes that have been launched by the government, which can actually enable farmers to implement some of the changes. And then it's very important that the farmers meet each other so that they just get to know in a friendly way that they have neighbors or people in the same cluster who actually want to cooperate. 
that's been one of the biggest successes of the, my festivals in general, getting people together for them to brainstorm or for a lot of spontaneous brainstorming occurs and a lot of new ideas and new projects have actually resulted from the festival. That's one of the things that I'm the most proud of. So my, the question that I asked you was pre predicated on the idea that two different groups coming together, surely there must be conflict. So the implication of my question, oh, did the farmers resist this uh, environmental initiative? Because there's an assumption that if it doesn't work economically, then why should we do it? And what you're saying is that it's actually led by one of the farmers. And so it's not outsiders telling people what to do, but an insider saying, actually, guys, have a think about this. But you've also got financial economic initiatives that will help support this new way of using the fields and so on. And that seems to me, um, a festival seems to be a really good way of bringing diverse people together to share ideas, creativity, and a, a sort of can-do attitude. How can we solve this problem rather than adversarially ending up entrenched in your separate uh, intentions? Absolutely. I think that one of the most important things that I do, and which is unconventional, but which is has been the hallmark of my life, is cross-pollination between different industry sectors. So farmers usually wouldn't be around artists, for example. People doing um, who are in charge of recycling in London, for example, I had one of the top guys from RAP. Uh, RAP is basically the Quango, the quasi-NGO, based in London, assisting the entire nation, especially business, to transition to the circular economy. They ordinarily wouldn't be exposed to artists and farmers either. I think that it's really the beauty of what I do that unusual bed fellows are thrown into the same situation and a lot of fruitful connections take place. Um, for that matter, just speaking to your, what your, your analysis of how it was so useful for these different disparate groups to be together, the ordinary public actually isn't aware of the huge policy changes afoot by the British government to fund what they call public, public goods with public money. So that's a whole new landscape recovery regime. Well, I don't want to call it just landscape recovery. A new agricultural subsidy reg regime, the heart of which, as a motto, is public money for public goods. So that part of farming going forward is to incorporate elements of regenerative agriculture and the reinstatement or reinvigoration of biodiversity with grant funding to farmers specifically. So we're educating the public about that as well, because that is an area of knowledge which ordinarily is quite specialist. It has been in the mainstream media somewhat, not a huge amount, but that is a subject which is very interesting to our local audience because it, there's a big agricultural, um, there's a, there's a, agriculture industry is the biggest industry in East Anglia. And also your festival, I, I believe there was some um, marketing workshops to help local businesses. Is that right? For, no, for artists, actually. So this is a festival which had marketing workshops for both farmers as well as artists, because these are two industries which, in my experience and from based on my observation, find marketing especially challenging. By my back of the envelope estimation, there are at least 5,000 fine art visual artists living in East Anglia. And the truth is that they are quite severely handicapped because they just don't um, have access to best in class marketing know-how, nor the culture of marketing themselves. Going back to my remarks about British social culture. <laughs> so that is something that I seek to remedy. And that actually the previous year was literally the best attended event of the festival. That's the one, fantastic. The marketing, the marketing workshop for for artists, because I think in in my experience, similar uh, uh, to what you've said, that I know a lot of writers and artists, and they, you know, uh, and I'm a writer myself. We all love doing the art and the writing, but kind of getting out there and selling. Oh gosh, it's just all too horrible and and embarrassing. And what your workshop has has helped people, I suppose, uh, overcome that, or perhaps find different ways of thinking about marketing, or um, the most important thing I have ever been able to pass along from all the festivals 
which are five cumulatively between EA Sustain and EA Festival, is the importance of cooperation. So that is what the artists took away, I, I hope. I mean, we gave them granular, detailed advice about how to use Instagram, how to be on the front foot, how to plan properly and to co-opt as many stakeholders into the marketing exercise well in advance of an art exhibition or project as possible. But the most important thing, and which was not natural and second nature, was to immediately think about when you're going to do a project, who can you bring into the, how can you create a wide tent of cooperation? This is not a natural way of thinking out here. For me, I live, breathe, and sleep this. That's, I, I won't do a project. I think about that first. I won't do a project unless I know I can bring in powerful stakeholders who are going to immediately amp up my marketing and get it out in, in front of a lot more eyeballs. So that's my innate modus operandi every day of everything I do. But that's something that needs to be inculcated more broadly. And so what has been the uh, reaction of the local community, people in East Anglia, to the festival? Oh, it's been phenomenal. I mean, it's um, it's pretty famous now. And I would say that I think it's totally reasonable to say it's the number one ideas festival in the East of England. And that is what has led me to be invited to, by Tate Modern and Battersea Power Station to do festivals or events there. And and this is the, the Albania festival that I'm going to be doing in the autumn is a direct result of that uh, because one of my speakers who's a renowned intellectual, invited me based on her excellent experience and friendship with me to do this project with her. So, I mean, I think it's gone really well. I think the issue is because of the funding environment declining, this is going to be the biggest challenge for any event-based company in the whole of England, outside of London. So that that's it's really a question of monetization and commercialization. In terms of the actual product of the festival and its events, I would say they're absolutely world-class and top-notch. Um, and I'm being recognized for that. And I'm very happy to report that after my very rocky start moving out here, I've probably become somewhat of the de facto culture mayor in this area of South Suffolk, North Essex. So I'm very proud of that. And that's actually made my life out here. And I think that's the most important thing for me personally and talking to you as my cousin that is the thing which has made my daily life very gratifying, fun, and varied. And I'm very happy living out here in the middle of nowhere nowadays, whereas I thought at the beginning that it was quite dispiriting and, and, and hopeless. So you come from big cities around the world internationally, and you were ill living in Hong Kong, coming to the quiet, what and from what you described, you know, deathly countryside. And you've really flourished and actually you've served the local community. Um, it's not about your ego, it's about um giving something to this community that you have made your own. And so uh, in terms of your own personal journey, how do you think this experience uh, and the festival and meeting all these experts and local people and connecting with all the different talents and skills of all these people, how has that changed you as a person, do you think? I actually think that living out here has made me much more broad-minded, even though it's a much, it's a very staunchly conservative area. And I think that's precisely why I have become much more broad-minded, because I'm naturally a extremely left-wing person. So I'm married to my audience, who's a 71-year-old retired barrister who reads The Spectator, Telegraph, and Country Life, and never the twain shall meet. But being in the breast of that type of culture, I've had to learn it pretty much inside and out and understand my audience. And actually in the process, because I'm somebody who takes learning really seriously, I expose myself and delve into all these intellectual, political, and social byways that it I would never, ever be pouring over country life or thinking about tuning into the Telegraph's online um, interview with Nigel Farage, for example. It's because I want to learn more about where I live and the people around me that I have taken pains to do that. And so actually it's been really eye-opening. And I, 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 and I think, I hope, it's made me much more broad-minded. 
I, I think it's also made me more diplomatic. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible that that's happened. <laughs> that is wonderful to hear. And I, but actually, you have a serious point there because in modern times, it seems to me, we are so polarized with all these debates possibly created by the social media technology where you can only tweet 120 characters or whatever. So discussion and opportunity for learning and empathy is so diminished. And we end up just pounding away with getting our own opinion out. We don't really listen. And so you end up with environmentalists and those who are anti-environment, or not, they're not anti-environmentalists. I suppose they have their own particular interests. They don't understand the environmental perspective and the environmental uh, perhaps also don't understand the other perspective and so on and so forth. And I, I use that as, a, as an example because we're Metro Wild and we're talking about that. But you could just take anything um, and there will be division. Um, whereas actually there is much to be said for collaboration, cooperation, taking a pause and listening to what somebody else that you don't agree with has to say. I think that's central to what I'm doing, and that explains why I present a radically wide gamut of thought leadership. So just to give you an example, which I think this is a fantastic example of the last EA festival in June, um, I had the editor-in-chief of Country Life, which and you can imagine that he his views, he's very traditional, he, he loves tradition, and rightly so, there's plenty of reasons to love tradition, and he's quite politically conservative, although he did advocate more housing in the countryside, which to some members of the audience or even who are very conservative is anathema. But in the same festival, I had two speakers, one who was the author of Africa, Africa is Not a Country, a Nigerian-British speaker named Deepo Faloyin, which is in that book is very much about how imperialist narratives do a disservice to the, the achievements and differences between African countries, and a philosopher and economist named Daniel Chandler, who wrote a book called Free and Equal, which is a restatement and I would just, I would just say a more, dige a di more digestible version of John Rawls's philosophy, the American moral philosopher who predicated his political prescription for a just society on the idea of an invisible veil where the rules of society should be those that would be agreed upon if you didn't know whether what your identity was going to be in society when you were born. Female, male, gay, straight, black, white. Okay, so that's quite radical, as you can imagine. And to present those two authors alongside somebody like Mark Hedges, editor-in-chief of Country Life, is something that I'm very, very proud of. And I continue to do that. I do that all the time. So I am doing um, a talk with the Duke of Beaufort soon at the Jockey Club Rooms in Newmarket in, in six weeks. That's just, just a, a, an example. But I will also be doing a talk at, in Albania with Sally Hayden, the Orwell Prize winner of 2022, who wrote a book about the bar barbarity of Libyan migrant detention centers operated on behalf of Italy with the complicity of the UNHCR, which is, a, you can imagine, you know, the people who come to the event with the Duke are not going to be that sympathetic to refugees necessarily. But, and then I get to present a radically different, you know, different cluster of thinking, of, of thinkers and, and thought when I present this Albania festival. That is what I revel in by basically. Being able to put my money where my mouth is, that I want to be fair and open-minded and curious as possible and to really live it and program it all the time. So we're coming to the end of our time together, cousin. What last words do you have for our listeners about the environment and sustainability? I think get educated. Otherwise, you'd really get bogged down in a sense of total helplessness and uh, even arming yourself with basic knowledge way beyond just scratching. You have to scratch way beneath the surface of the headlines. I mean, get into subjects like the uh, new agricultural transition, 
Uh, there's been a lot written about that. You know, go and it, you actually a lot of it is sh- ignorance leads to a lot of feel feelings of helplessness. That's something that you can easily counteract, and then you can make then you ha- you'll have much more of an inner compass about your decision making every single day. So that is my number one advice, and and I think actually that will counteract a lot of feelings of negative feelings and helplessness. Um, I, I don't, I, not everybody has to become like a huge champion or cheerleader for the environment. I think just get educated if you really do want to introduce some change, uh, and moderation into your present life. Just remember everybody is not Jesus Christ. I think, I think that that's what we always have to remember, whatever we are trumpeting about our morality or ethics. I mean, small change counts. So, you know, and, and it starts with learning more about each subject. Brilliant. Thank you, Joanne Uwe. Thank you so much for coming on to Metro Wild. I love the cousin. You can find credits, photos and links to some of the things we talked about on the show notes page. Go to metrowild.co.uk and search for Joanne Uwe. That's O-O-I. The views expressed by my guests are entirely their own and do not necessarily reflect my views. This podcast is part of the larger Metro Wild magazine style blog. Go to metrowild.co.uk to have a look at the range of articles featured there, all about city life and wild nature. If you enjoyed this conversation with Joanne Uwe on the Metro Wild podcast, there are other episodes you can check out. For example, ecologist Hugh Warwick talks to me about how hedgehogs can save the planet in episode two of the podcast. And for those of you who prefer to listen to podcasts rather than sit down with written text, I'm also offering selected articles from the blog as audio episodes here on this podcast. Go back to episode three for two articles about climate. I read for you a book review of the climate book and also a story about climate anxiety. I hope you will follow or subscribe to the Metro Wild podcast wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify and Audible. It's free. New episodes will then appear in your pod listening app as soon as I release them into the wild. A handy link to find the podcast is podfollow.com forward slash Metro Wild. The link to the full Metro Wild multimedia magazine again is metrowild.co.uk. You can also like or follow the Metro Wild Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Metro Wild UK. I'm Yang Mei Ui. You can find me on social media as at Tiger Spirit UK. The podfollow link again for this podcast is podfollow.com forward slash Metro Wild. Thank you so much for listening and see you again soon.